that. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I don't even know if you can already hear and see me um, because it seems like on YouTube, you can only start at the time. So maybe you're just seeing me now. Like, I don't know what you see. This is like always an experiment of like, what do people actually see? But I think you can see me. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. <laughs> um, thank you for joining. How do I pronounce your name? Rush up. Rush up. Thank you for joining. Hi. Hi. That's so amazing to see you here. I see, I see people on Twitter and then it's so amazing to see them on other platforms as well, especially if you have the same um the same username and i was telling somebody the other day that at kubecon i expect everybody to wear like a sign around their neck you know like a like a cardboard with their twitter profile print like the top header of the twitter profile printed on top of it because i don't know anybody in person so i would just try like to walk around and to connect people people's faces with their <laughs> twitter um account that's kind of what i'm gonna do hi everybody it's so great oh awesome i feel like i want to host like a live stream every day like every day no not every day every week um because it would just be really nice to keep this conversation going and to also these live streams is such a great opportunity to hear from you of the kind of content that you would like to see the kind of questions that are out there because obviously otherwise you would usually hear from people's questions and concerns and uncertainties on using, for example, Kubernetes when you go to meetups. But right now we can't go to meetups. So this is the only way to really hear about all those questions and concerns. Um, so, hola. I forgot my Spanish. <laughs> I used to actually live in Spain and I used to learn Spanish, which is a fun story. Um, and I forgot it all. I feel like I have to refresh it for KubeCon. Um, Cloud native and short note. I don't know what that exactly means, but okay. Um, I'm able to set up Argus CD. This is an interesting question on GKE standard cluster, but getting issues on GKE. Oh God, <laughs> using the short forms, it's sometimes really like <laughs> um, autopilot. Um, I actually haven't used the GKE autopilot before, which I um, should maybe look into. It's something that I'm, I feel like I should be very, very careful about. Hi, Alex, great to see you here. I feel like it's something that people should be very careful about of using anything auto. Like, <laughs> it's like, I feel like uh, companies want to make things easy by automating things. And then for automating things, they abstract so much to weigh, which is just could end up confusing you a lot more. So if you are like, I mean, I don't know how experienced you are, but like if you, I feel like if you're getting started, you should try to use the raw version as much as possible instead of using any developer platforms or any abstractions. Um, so yeah, but I would definitely, if you have any questions on Argo CD specifically, I would drop into their Slack channel. If you have any questions on specific cloud native tools, they usually have either Slack channels within the Kubernetes Slack within the CNCF Slack or they have their own Slacks all together. And those are great areas to, to ask questions. Um, hi there. I What time is it in India right now? What time is it where you are? I'm just assumed that you are like around that area. Um, but where's everybody from? Um, I'm trying to host these early so enough people who are in later time zones can join. So that's why I was kind of thinking, um, wow, 11 p.m. in Japan. What are you doing up that late? I am I go to bed at like 9 p.m. I'm that kind of person. And I wake up really late as well. <laughs> um, Cape Town. I have been in Cape Town. It's beautiful. It's I was just telling a friend the other day about my my journey, my, my trip to Cape Town, and it was it was very very pretty. Um, I really enjoyed that. Bangladesh, awesome. So I oh 11 a.m. in Brazil. I feel like this is the ter perfect time to host a live stream, and I was choosing this time as well. I just want to like uh, restate that it's the it's the 22nd of the second 2022 at 2 p.m. this live stream. That's why I had to host this live stream because I thought it was such a beautiful number, right? <laughs> I just, I had to do it. Uh, 7.30 p.m. in India. How many time zones do you have in India? I feel like this is something I should know about. Um, 
Belgium, 3 p.m. Yes. Where else? Where's everybody? It's so amazing to have so many different people join. Awesome. So I have a little bit of an agenda for this live stream. Just, just a little bit of an agenda. I'm not great on agendas. Like I'm a person who jumps around a lot also in my work. I'm like, oh, this looks cool. And I'm like, oh, this looks cool. <laughs> so it's sometimes difficult to keep my attention on one one tool but i have a little bit of an agenda that i want to share because especially right now at the beginning of the live stream you can always ask questions i would just like in between of showing you content that i found and that i think is really cool um i will address those questions so i hope you can see my screen last time we had some glitches of like the screens don't really change properly on stream yet and i don't know how to fix that i might have to switch my streaming software um but ultimately this is the stream uh not this the screen <laughs> i want to share so this is the this week's newsletter and i want to kind of in these live streams showcase always the open source project that i chose to highlight now in this case i chose to highlight wallet cube uh which was created by or like the main people behind the main contributors behind it right now are from Commodore, which is a tool that I showcased in some of my previous videos. And I wanted to show showcase you that tool called Wallet Cube because it's um, a really nice way, especially when you're getting started with Kubernetes YAML fests, to better understand what's going on. Um, so to to validate your manifests, to clean them up and to secure them. And under the hood, this tool is using these three tools. Under the hood, it's using Kubevela that I haven't, that I've heard about a long time ago and I should probably make a video about. So let me know if you're curious about a video on that. Then Kubecuddle Neat that I showed you in the previous live stream and Trivi from, from the Aqua open source team that I also made a video about. So this tool is basically combining the other tools under the hood. I don't know about Kubella, I think it's also just a, a CLI tool, but ultimately you just use those tools usually in your CLI. So that means you have to understand how to install them, or basically when you get onboarded on these tools, you have to install them um, in your terminal to use them actually. And uh, Valid Cube basically provides you the option to paste your Kubernetes YAML manifest. So for example, let's assume you're not sure if your Kubernetes YAML manifest is valid, then you can just paste it here, right? And then um, click validate, and it's gonna validate your manifest for you and see if it's actually a uh, valid YAML. I think this is how it works. So I haven't, <laughs> I haven't used Kubella before, but I think that's how it works. And similarly, so, I basically took this YAML manifest, this is a deployment YAML manifest, right? This is a normal deployment resource. And I took that from my React application, this, which I use for various examples. I feel like I have to produce, an, or I should produce an updated version. But ultimately I took this deployment YAML file and I just pasted it. Like I just took it as it is and I uh, pasted it in the UI here. Uh, that's the first thing I did. And then um, it didn't really do much when I hit clean. So I went ahead and I deployed that this deployment on my Kubernetes cluster. And the thing is, this is just, these are all the values that I want to customize in my deployment, right? Like these are all the values that I want to specify. For example, I want to specify which image to use and other values, right? So, but once you deploy it on your Kubernetes cluster, it will add additional fields. It will add all of those default values that are part of a deployment resource, right? So all of these, lots of these files is nothing I specified, right? So for example, this is like additional information that if I want to debug that specific resource, they would be in the way of me actually debugging it. So you can click clean and it will um, kind of compress it will compress your entire YAML manifest that you have here with all of those additional values that are added to it by default by the Kubernetes API on the deployment resource. Um, and just dis display basically the most important parts that would be uh, most useful in your debugging process of that manifest. Now, you can also hit secure and it will use Trivi um, from Acre to scan um, the container image for for any for any vulnerabilities and you can see here the output um and you can see like the the severity of the um of the vulnerability and other things um and this is like i mean i 
personally, like if I would want to use Truvy, for example, to its fullest extent, I wouldn't necessarily use uh, ValidCube, but to show how you can easily um, validate and debug um, some aspects of your community's manifest, that it's a great tool. So it's just validcube.com where you can find it. Um, yeah, let me know what you think about it. I think it's really great, especially when you get started or when you just want to debug like a specific resource and make sure it's working. Um, So this is a good question. <laughs> Archiva need this YAML config sensitive information. Is there a risk in posting on a website? Um, that's a great question. And probably I should spend more time thinking about it. Um, now, in this case, I literally just, I don't think that there was anything super sensitive or like anything that I shouldn't have displayed in here. Usually you don't want to have anything like anyway displayed within your manifest like you would not want to keep your sensitive information inside of your um yama manifest right you want to keep them outside um or like in a in a specific format so it's like it's not visible like even if um yeah people shouldn't have direct access to it even if they have access to your kubernetes cluster you wouldn't want to have sensitive information um stored inside the yaml itself um so in this case i don't think that i showed you anything super sensitive <laughs> on those yaml manifests you can prove me wrong um that's actually something that i was so i was once doing and that's like i i think a year ago or so i was using some um, package tracing tool for my university degree and it was very cool tool i forgot the name of it it's like a really commonly used and we had to use it for an assignment and it was really really cool to use and i want to make a video on it but i couldn't quite figure out of what information that got displayed uh was in any remote way sensitive so i asked somebody and that person was like oh there's nothing wrong with it like you can show everything but i'm i'm just i'm very careful with these things usually so i i try not to so yeah, you wouldn't want to pass in, like, I agree with that, only if you pass in arguments, like if you pass in, or like if you display, I guess, raw data in your YAML manifest, but you wouldn't want to, also with your container images, you wouldn't want to pass in um, arguments, like your container images should be able to run as it is, right? Uh, without modifying it upon running it. Um, are the, options to sort properties in YAML files by name or which structure do you follow? So wait, let me show you, let me prepare something and then show you what I, how I understand the question. And then we can talk about it. Does that sound good? Also, thank you for joining. Benny has a really cool channel. If you're using JavaScript, TypeScript, check out Benny's channel. Uh, feel free to post it here. Um, Oh, wait, <laughs> so many questions. I'm getting distracted by all the questions. Um, so here is my, ooh. let me, okay, no, it's, that's what it's supposed to show. So I just took the raw deployment YAML as I have it right now in Git, um, which is, I guess you can always improve something, but this is how it looks like, right? And if I click clean, it doesn't really change much. It just kind of, for example, changes to put CPU first and then memory. So probably if you mean that, I just, whoop, which structure do you follow? What do you mean by which structure do I follow? Like when I create those YAML manifests, um, I usually copy paste. <laughs> so I look for an example and then I replace the values as I see fit. And then usually when you have an example, it's not how you want it. So for example, at the beginning, I didn't have resource limits. So I added those resource limits um, based on a tool shouting at me for not having resource limits. Um, and then I think as it changes, for example, CPU and memory, I think within those aspects, it would then like this tool, like uh, cube, cube color neat, it would just um, switch them around by alphabet letters, maybe? That's how I would assume. So I, N, P, yeah, I think. Well, let's let's try this out. Let's put the port earlier or later. Well, it changed it. It put the image pull policy, put it higher up, right? So I would assume that everything that's kind of on the same same depth is sorted out. Um, 
Where's my coffee cup? Oh, this is the next thing I want to talk about. So um, <laughs> people are talking about swag because KubeCon is coming up. And I realized I never gave out swag on my channel. And in most swag stores, you can just order in bulk. So I was thinking of having partially an online giveaway and partially bring swag to KubeCon um, like in person to, to give it out there. But I'm not sure what kind of swag. And then I realized so I have these two swag items. I have this cup. I don't know if you've seen it before. It's just basically the my super beautifully designed 100 Days of Kubernetes logo uh, <laughs> with 100 Days of Kubernetes written on it. I like this cup because it's black inside, so you don't have like any stains or anything. You know, like when you use a cup a lot, it gets stains. It sounds disgusting, but it's not disgusting. It's a normal life of a coffee cup. <laughs> um, anyway, so I realized I don't really like this logo anymore, and I don't like that this, I mean, yeah, I don't, I'm not too fond of this logo. I don't know if I should keep it. I'm not personally too fond of it. Let me know what you think. Um, but uh, I was basically thinking of doing a redesign of the 100 Days of Kubernetes logo um, and then creating new swag around that. Uh, because obviously I don't want people to wear my swag. I want people to, rent, to wear the 100 Days of Kubernetes swag if they wear any swag that I produce in any meaningful way. And then here's my logo that's kind of my... A and then U for a nice Erlice logo. Um, and that's kind of my, my website here. So this is my coffee cup. So I'm a bit more careful to not spill it over myself. <laughs> um, so that's that. So let me know what kind of swag would be interesting. Um, I found this is also something funny that I wanted to show you. So I, I forgot which part was funny about it, but I think there was something funny. So I found this website which produces ethical swag and you can order like swag boxes and other stuff. Like for me, it's important that it's produced in an ethical way and I'm not just distributing low quality uh, stuff that everybody just ends up throwing away, right? Um, so I found this website and it looks really cool, but you can only order bulk. Um, and there's this onboarding and then lifestyle was it here where i found it there was like some stuff where i was like confused why it's part of part of the onboarding i forgot where it is and what i wanted to show you but they have really cool swag items um also useful swag items i mean i don't think i would give around helmets but they have really cool items ultimately that i think would be interesting to look into um so yeah if you have any thoughts on which swag items would be cool then do let me know um i'm looking into that and i'm also planning to have a giveaway here on the channel um so stay tuned for that right uh what else there are lots of comments and questions so i wonder if the yammer person is done in the server side or on the website uh chance that's that's a good question is somebody from so people from commodore were like oh we're gonna join the the <laughs> the live stream i'm not sure if they actually joined in the end but um how could i find that out if it's done on which side um i feel like i don't want to show too much that i didn't test because i'm always worried that i'm gonna show things that i'm not meant to show on the live stream um but yeah it's a good question of where is the yammer actually sent to right um where is it yeah where is it being processed um, or where do those tools process it? I think, I mean, I don't really see a reason of why they would have to, like why they can't just, I don't know. This is an open source tool. Star your open source tools. They are get People get really happy if you give them a little star, right? Um, let's see. Oh, that's to use it. Deploy. I don't want to use that. Hmm. Maybe it's done in a backend. But where does that? <laughs> I feel like I don't have enough knowledge of how these things work. Um, but yeah, I'm sure people here could figure that out. Anyway, where is your... Oh, this is an interesting question. Why did you abandon the blockchain world? Do you think it's possible to have a mix of Kubernetes and blockchain? Um, so to address your first question, I think this is based on one of my recent video of 
where I basically detailed right, more info of why I moved to Aqua and became their open source developer advocate. So um, if you are curious, check out my previous video that I uploaded today. They also released a blog post that I've written for them where I just provide an overview um, of some of the reasons why I joined. Um, so you can read that as well. But the thing is why I, I've been in the blockchain world. Um, so I was working for close to four whole years in the blockchain space and in the blockchain world that's especially at the time it was like a lot of things happen or it feels like a lot of things happen right um when you're in a startup environment it feels like everything moves a lot faster like it feels like a month is a year kind of of like the amount of things that happen within a month um so I was first working as technical analyst, then I was working as engineer, and then I was working as developer advocate and community manager. And um, to be honest, I moved away from blockchain. I wanted to change industry because I burned out. And 2020, I just simply I burned out completely, and I was I was done. I was <laughs> I was like I couldn't do anything anymore, and that was the main reason why why I moved away from blockchain. And then there were like other reasons, like not enough opportunities, maybe especially for women, there are not enough opportunities at the time. Now I see that more and more people start to talk about uh, blockchain-based um, applications and, and similar, right? But ultimately what people are talking now about, it's actually the same kind of things that people have been already experimenting around with uh, several years ago. And now it's gonna become more mainstream, which is great to see, like it's great for them, but I honestly don't want to spend more time on these kind of conversations until I see something new happening. Um, so that's just, you're not gonna see me talk about blockchain. I have strong opinions about it um, because there are very great applications and very great research done into it, which is separate from the NFT stuff. And I have to, okay, I have to have a little rant about it. <laughs> um, so there's, you know, like when I was in the blockchain space, I was involved in some uh, experiments, like experimental, I guess, uh, social experiments on, for example, universal basic income. How could you implement a token that kind of creates a sub economy within your economy? So people have universal basic income, which is a great idea, right? And which is something very amazing to experiment around with. And some regions, for example, some a region in the south of France, they already using cryptocurrencies as they are kind of sub currency um, between themselves within that region. And there are several of these kind of experiments. And I think they're very amazing because blockchain is enabling these kind of experiments. However, separate to that, the whole trading NFT world is something that has been evolving over the past years. And it's just, it feels to me like it's always the same. It's just getting more and more hyped. And I personally don't want to engage with that. <laughs> so uh, do you think it's possible to have a mix of Kubernetes and blockchain? Now to the more technical part, I don't see a practical implication of like, a, you know, you wouldn't want to, for me, Kubernetes is something that you can run in uh, highly, do you say versatile environments, like really small scale to really large scale environments. Like it's so versatile of how you run it and you would want to run it to scale and to be effective and efficient, right? So that's why you, for me, you would run or use Kubernetes and uh, container-based workloads. Now, for me, a blockchain is something where you share um, kind of universal truth to, you commit a truth to the blockchain. You wouldn't want to have um, the entire state of an application being committed to that blockchain. And now we are going into details, but um, ultimately it's nothing where you would want to run large scale applications to like directly based on a blockchain. So you could have, for example, an application that's based uh, that's running as a like, Kubernetes-based infrastructure, and then it commits like truths of its states, like um, for, yeah, I don't know how to put it. Can I say encrypted state? Uh, like it can commit like a hash of that state to the to the blockchain to say like, this is like the current state of the application. And then uh, once the application is, uh, is evolving, you can verify over time that the application evolved from like this one point, right? And nobody tempered with the application in between. Something like that. That's how I can see it. I don't I don't really see like I would see it separately, Kubernetes and then the blockchain if you want to have certain applications. Like for example, um there's some um, uh, supply chain applic applications for blockchain as well that are interesting, but there's nothing really like I haven't seen something actually coming out beyond experiments from that. So okay, long story short, what else? Um 
regarding this up RCDG. I would really like for anything that's specific to an application, ask them directly, either just create an issue or ask them in their Slack channel um, if you're struggling with it and share exactly what you're struggling with it, like what you've done, um, what you're struggling with and what kind of information you need um, to get going. Like people need a kind of context. Um, that's a highly specific question. There's a data on Kubernetes community that I would check out that I can also post the link. I also mentioned in my previous live stream that you can check out for like uh, demos on how to have run stateful applications. Um, Okay, what is the YAML validation site that I was showing? Let me show that to you again. So it's called ValidCube. Let me post it in the chat. So it's just validcube.com. Uh, I'm just switching between my different screens. So this is the site. What do I think about Crossplane? Hi, Arthur. Uh, <laughs> great to meet you. Um, what do I think about Crossplane? So I used Crossplane heavily in my previous demos, um, especially throughout the past year. And I think it's one of those applications really show what you can do with, um, yeah, what you can do in the Kubernetes world, right? Uh, <laughs> what, kind of the magic. So you want to have, in, especially in a lot of demos, where you just show like specific use cases, you want to have kind of a wow effect. While you're teaching something, you want to have that wow moment that gets people curious and try things out themselves, right? Um, and Crossplane achieves that really well. I built the with some coworkers at Sivo, we've built the Sivo Crossplane provider. Um, so I'm also familiar kind of with the process of building it. Ultimately, there's little difference to me and to many other people that I've talked to between an operator and cross-plane resources. Um, so maybe check out another video. I'm sure I have videos on like, yeah, Kubernetes operators, or maybe you're familiar with it. But ultimately, there's little difference. And um, I don't really understand how teams would use it right now, like actually implement it, like the benefits of that, because you always need like this initial cluster where you spin up your initial cross plane resources to then spin up further resources. So I would love to see like a proper demo of like how a team is using it right now. And that's kind of what I'm missing. Um, oh, that's really kind. Uh, I'm trying. Sometimes I divert and I can just talk for hours, I guess. Um, ooh. I can tell you why there are lots or lots of web devs <laughs> because a lot of people who change into tech, who get into like get into tech later on, um, beyond their degree, I guess, or separate instead of their degree, they look for boot camps. And a lot of boot camps are focused on making lots of money with the least effort, right? Or yeah, to get off participants. And it's a lot of times easier to grasp what's happening within a browser within like the web application if you change for example certain values within the css um or the html or and then go from there to uh, javascript and so on then um starting from something more abstract on a lower level that's and that's why you can target with web development if you run a boot camp you can target a mass of uh people to, to get started with it. And that's why you have lots of web developers coming from boot camps. That does not mean that every, um, like the boot camps are generally bad. Uh, it's just that a lot of boot camps are after making money. And that's why you have lots of people entering the space from that aspect, right? And I've also got started with web development through that kind of boot camp environment. Um, that's my thoughts. There's also this, there's this, what was it? There's this boot camp that was, first really, really praised upon. And then it kind of got a really bad reputation for it. I forgot the name of it. If I remember, I will maybe do a little video on it. Um, yeah. Um, what else? I, hmm, there was another question. Value of degree, like since we're talking about these things, I'm doing a computer science online degree part-time since four years right now. I have one more year to go. Um, I changed it from six years to five years by compressing some of the modules. So this is my second degree. Um, and I, it's taking me a long time to complete. 
And um, I'm doing it mainly for my, like when people ask me, why do you do a degree if you already have a job and things going on in the space and so on. But I want to have it kind of for my personal achievement, for my personal goals, that a degree can give you rewards from a different perspective. So at work, I feel very rewarded when I solve certain problems, when I give uh, when I speak at a conference and I showcase how I solve a use case, I get rewarded when I manage to implement a tool that I'm new to on the cluster and things like that, right? Like these kind of technical challenges. But it's not as much the theory that gives me reward within my work environment and within my university setting, the learning the theory and kind of getting rewarded by grades and uh, having that kind of study environment gives me the additional reward from academia, if that makes sense, um, that I somehow crave. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a lot of time investment. And um, a degree in many cases, um, like if you, if you just do a degree, it will not, it will sadly not get you ahead in many industries. Like in lots of industries, you need a degree, right? But in others, I feel like you always have to kind of show something more of course there's such a large pool of applicants for every job that you're going for so a lot of people what i've seen like from my previous degree um they finish their full-time degree right after so they go to college or high school then they go to university or college or how you call it so they go finish university right and then um they uh, have the university degree and then they can't find a job or no full-time job beyond, beyond internships, for example. And then they go and do a master's. So then they leave their master's. They have a master's qualification, but they don't have the work experience. But they kind of need to be paid like somebody who has a master's, right? Which is or similar. So it's difficult for companies to then hire people who already have a master's. Um, there are some other paths. For example, in Germany, it's really big to, do, um, to incorporate work within your degree. So you basically have depending on your semester you have like two to three days a week where you work at the company and then you study the other days and there are like lots of companies in germany who offer um for university students uh part-time work basically so um yeah that's that's an option or things like that that gets an that's an option that kind of gives you further work experience while you're studying right which can get you ahead so i wouldn't just like value of a degree itself it's not like it's what you add to it that makes it valuable right for example my computer science degree right now i get a lot more value from it because i'm working and i can apply the things that i learn at work to my degree and vice versa um um i can't speak for machine learning um the thing is, so I got asked <laughs> a while ago, somebody asked me why do so many more women go into research fields like machine learning versus infrastructure management, infrastructure, um, yeah, SRE, sysadmin tasks, that kind of thing. And uh, specifically, like that question was focused on women. Um, so, but overall, what I want to get to is that uh, areas like machine learning are more focused on the research to academia side of things, right? Um, so they are more competitive in that area versus where you have to learn more of the theory and apply more of the theory within your research versus DevOps is more ap applicable. Like you need to practice real world scenarios. And that's why I think it's really important to really um, to learn how to use open source tools in the CNCF cloud native ecosystem if you want to get started within DevOps, because they will teach you later on how you can get started also with enterprise products. Like there's not much, or usually they are fairly similar on how the enterprise product works versus how an open source product works. Um, but for example, if you like, if you're not using an enterprise um, I don't know, tool for something specifically, you can always try out the open source versions and then your experience from the open source tools is far more valuable than you having had experience with one specific enterprise product. Um, but regarding the job roles within each, I mean, you will find right now there's a huge demand for DevOps, cloud engineer, um, people who are, who are really good with Kubernetes, who have like other skills such as I mean, such as, for example, engineering skills, but then also have that cloud native Kubernetes specific knowledge, right? Um, I can't really speak for job opportunities within machine learning. I would assume they are more like that there's far 
tighten it closer, like let fewer roles available. Uh, definitely probably fewer roles. And also probably within machine learning, you have to go the academia. I would assume you have to go the academia route and then to get to the good positions later on, like you really have to over a long time build towards those more senior um, interesting positions. But those are just some of my thoughts. I don't know if that's real. <laughs> um, okay. I don't know what this means. Maybe I know it if you can spell it out. What else? Um, <laughs> what all plans do you have on near your desk? Um, it's So I changed the lens on this recording because I wanted to make sure that you don't see my face like this close to the camera <laughs> because it makes me self-conscious. Um, so right now I have one plant on my desk. Let me get it this plant that's on my desk right now. It's a beautiful plant that I got as a gift um, a while ago. Let me put it on the floor. And then I have, I can make a plant too at some point. Then I have like lots of plants here on the, on the side that are kind of, this is like a hanging plant that kind of spreads its wings, which are really long actually. So here, this, anyway, I have lots of plants in my apartment because I don't have space for a pet. So I need plants instead. Um, yeah, might be interesting to show. Uh, hello there. Welcome. Uh, who's joining? Wow, these are really rare questions. Do you have any advice for someone already in the DevOps software space looking to move into more of a teaching developer advocate role? So generally, and I, I've repeated in lots of my previous videos, there's a huge demand of the like for developer advocates. Like the, the number of companies who reach out to me about developer advocacy is just crazy. And it's not just because I'm doing this YouTube stuff, but um, the demand for developer advocates is that companies need developer advocates because they realize that product development becomes more and more community driven. And if you can't keep up with that, um, and you're narrowing your focus on your users then um, and have this user centric approach, then that's, making you fall behind. Anyway, so there's a huge demand for developer advocates. Um, the problem is many companies need developer advocates who are a bit more senior. Like you will find if you are new to developer advocacy and you don't have, let's address this first, and you don't have a heavy engineering based background, but you maybe have a community management background or a similar applicable skills. So in, in developer advocacy, you can focus on uh, public speaking, you can focus on technical writing, on documentation writing. Lots of companies need technical writers. Um, but so for junior developer advocate roles, for something more specific like technical writers, um, usually people who are within a company would know better for about roles. So if you're looking for these kind of roles, approach people who are reach out to people who are working within developer advocates, developer relations teams, because they will know more of the needs within the company. And usually these roles don't get promoted as much because they need such a, they, they're looking for specific people. Like that's how it seems to me. Like, yeah, like in the past I've worked at companies and we didn't really promote um, the developer relations, developer advocacy needs externally. Um, so do you have any advice for someone already in software DevOps? That's the thing. What companies are looking for publicly a lot, and there's huge demand as said, um, are people who have a software development, engineering background, DevOps background, and can then move into developer advocacy. So what I would recommend you is start with public speaking, right? Talk about, try to talk about your engineering work, or if you contribute to open source, try to apply to, to conferences to talk about your use cases, right? It's conferences don't want to see make up, made up examples. They want to see real examples where you struggled with something and you found a solution to that problem and you show a specific use case of here's how you make it work. And so if you have experience as a software DevOps engineer, then you can bring these really valuable inputs into your developer advocacy work. And that's why it was, for example, so valuable for me to work as SRE to see really like, how do I deploy things in production? Um, so my advice is really like try, maybe get started with public speaking, apply to some conferences, get your first experience in public speaking, also get a feel for it. Maybe you don't like it. And if you don't like it, there are also lots of developer advocates who are more focused 
on the technical writing, uh, blog post writing, documentation writing aspect. And there are lots of companies who need technical writers because good companies treat their documentation as a product. So you want to have people who know how to handle those products. There's actually another tool that I wanted to show you if you're curious, if you're curious, if you're not, just let me know in the chat and I will stop talking, which is Dear Taxes, which I got introduced to by a friend. And it's this really like it's this framework to write documentation. And I'm right now in the process of implementing that for our for the Aqua open source products because I want to make sure that there's basically one single point of truth of how we write documentation. So this is basically what I'm um using there. Yeah. Um, or what I want to implement to make sure that we have coherent, you say coherent, we have consistent documentation over time. Um, these are like really like specific questions that I can into like that I can talk about in a specific video, but I feel like in a live stream, it's a bit difficult to talk about these. Uh, I will note them down. So keep posting also technical questions because they will feed into other videos. Um, they give me video ideas for basically. Um, what do you do to keep fit by sitting long hours at desk? Do you think I'm fit? <laughs> Um, uh, I'm, I'm really trying. <laughs> um, so I'm doing, actually, I stopped going to the gym since things got strange around the world. Um, and yeah, I'm not really interested in going back to the gym. So I do home workouts, which is called, it's called center. I can, let me find it. Center, uh, by Chris Hemsworth, the guy who, who plays four, he has, he has an, an app, an online app that I'm using um, to keep fit. So let me post it here. Um, that's what I'm using. And it has, it has meal plans and it has, is it posting it? And it has meditations and it has yoga and it has with equipment, without equipment. And I think it's far better investment if you have want to invest into it. Um, then like into a kind of a program, then going to a gym. Personally, I think that I also go running and do other things and try to, in my free time, to just stay active because if you're sitting all day, right, you have to stay active somehow. Um, awesome. So what else is there? Difference between DevOps, the DevOps and SRE. So for me, the difference between DevOps and SRE is that as an SRE, you focus also, you focus on improving the tools to provide you further insights into your deployments, um, enhance your security, your observability of your applications, but also you are not only enhancing tools, you're also creating your own tools. Um, so it's kind of like SRE is more like the culture of um, reaching goals and how you implement it into your engineering teams um, versus DevOps is more, it's more like the passive way of doing things. That's how I would classify it. Now, obviously, depending on the size of your team, you might have somebody who does both. Also, SRE, generally, I would place that as more in organizations that are more cloud native focused versus DevOps is more like the separate previous way on how companies did things. That's, that's how I would classify it. But that's my definition. What else? Yeah, share your questions, share anything that I could talk about or maybe video ideas or anything related. Um, any tips to be more productive, successful in initial four to six months of joining a company? I think it's really clear to set expectations. So right now when I joined Aqua, it's, it, it was really important for me that I knew what was expected from the team, from other teams on my role and um, that we agreed upon um, some initiatives that I'm working towards. Um, so expectations are a big part of it. Get the expectations straight. Um, make sure that you identify really with the company's culture. That's something I talked about in my previous video, but really those, the trial period is not just a trial period in the first six months for companies to see like if they want to work long-term with you. It's also a way for you to see if you can see yourself long-term with the company, right? So it's similar to interviews. It's a both-sided process, right? Um, but to be more productive, it really helps to set clear goals on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, yeah, to that's something I struggle with. I jump between different things and then I don't have like this one accomplishment on a day-to-day -day basis that I'm aiming for. Um, so that's one thing. 
um, make sure to, especially early on, to pair as much as possible with people to get their input, to get their thoughts, um, because later on it might become more difficult to do that, to get that feedback. And invest lots of time in planning and kind of setting the structure for you to succeed long term, um, depending on your role that will look differently, I guess. Um, oh, thank you for joining. Bye bye. Uh, <laughs> that's nice. Um, Will you cover Istio in 100 Days of Kubernetes? I think I already have a video on Istio. I could make an updated version of me being evolved and knowing more about what Istio is used for and how to use, um, use it. I haven't seen Istio much in the wild. I don't know if companies are using it. I would love to hear for, from my end user companies how much they are using it. Um, I have, I have a video, I think, on Istio and also LinkedIn. And LinkedIn was just a lot easier to use to get started with. Um, but if there's interest, I could make an updated version or a specific use case on using Istio. That might be interesting. Um, yeah, check out Kunal's channel. He has lots and lots and lots of amazing content there. In a network point of view, how do you secure your pods? How do you limit traffic between namespaces? Um, there are lots of different ways you can do that. Um, so your pods, securing your pods starts early on before you even before you even deploy anything to Kubernetes, right? It starts with you securing your application to identifying vulnerabilities within your application and then securing the containers and it kind of triples down from there. I can make a more comprehensive or like maybe even a, like a course on how to think about each part. But the thing is with those, with those tutorials, like I like to really think about what I'm saying, right? I don't want to tell you things right now in a live stream that later on when I start reading about, it, I'm actually like, no, this is not what I would tell you now or then, like then in that case, right? Um, but great question. I'm going to note that down and make a video on, on how to think of the different parts of securing your infrastructure lifecycle, infrastructure and application lifecycle. Let's put it like that. Um, oh God. 100 days of issue. I want to say something really mean that that 100 days would not be enough for Istio, <laughs> but I'm not going to, well, oh no, I said it, but yeah, that was my first thought. Um, funny. Yeah. Anything else? Did I ever see something? Um, this one. Hi there. I hope you're still part of this live stream. If not, um, maybe I can find you online <laughs> and share my response to you. Um, <laughs> yeah, wait, let's finish with this one. Yeah, great idea. It's, I mean, there must be people who have more comprehensive courses. I just hate that a lot of those courses are paid for, right? That's kind of the, the sad part to it. Um, here is that question, the question that I looked at. Do I need a certification course to learn DevOps or learn from YouTube to learn? Um, some suggestions, uh, I'm new to coding. Should I choose DevOps or some something else? Um, that's a great question. I don't have, so the thing is my response, well, obviously different to somebody else's response who comes from a similar background to yours. Um, so my background specifically, I was getting started in the blockchain space and then I transitioned to from a developer advocate in the blockchain space to a developer advocate in a DevOps space, meaning there are lots and lots of skills that you can transfer. And so some of my coding skills, um, my technical writing skills, my public speaking skills, all those things I could transfer to the DevOps space, um, which was obviously very useful for me to, to get started. Um, if you're completely new, I would really, um, or like if I was going back to getting started, like putting myself in your shoes, I would try to first have a more engineering focused role um, or solution architect focused role. Um, maybe not solution architect, but more like something more hands on because the thing is within developer advocacy, for example, you are um, more high level, like you, you kind of have so many moving parts and that makes sometimes difficult to dive into something more specifically. So I would highly suggest you to when you get started with DevOps, um, to identify the key areas that you want to learn about. So for example, if you want to specialize in a cloud native ecosystem, right, then you will want to find companies that offer roles within that 
domain, right? Um, so I would always go and look, first look at job descriptions and what kind of companies you would want to work for and what kind of the job descriptions they have. And in this job description, they will tell you what they are looking for, what kind of skills they're looking for. And then depending on those companies, a lot of those skills you can learn through using open source cloud native tools that are just openly available through you and you can learn them through YouTube videos for through your own curiosity through starting to writing about it to using other people's project projects um, into your own in your own projects. So the different pathway, I think, not doing the structured approach of taking or doing a boot camp or course or certification will require a bit more of you and your own curiosity and your own learning and structuring your own learning as well, right? There's some, there's a blog post that I've written about something similar that I can link in the description later on. Um, I need to drink something. So a lot of my previous work and right now, a lot of things are written in Go. So I'm not a great <laughs> Go developer, but um, yeah, I'm not, well, I'm not programming on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not like right now. I'm not at least. Uh, maybe that will change eventually. Right now, my work is really like. I mean, at Steve, I was doing lots of infrastructure management, so I wasn't programming on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and right now, I'm still getting started. So maybe that will change in me doing more programming stuff, like hands-on. Uh, but even if I create plugins right now, it's not. I wouldn't consider it really as programming. Um, yeah um so but go um what else yeah i should probably refresh a lot of my knowledge <laughs> as well uh for my degree right now i'm using so i used in my previous module i used python and then now i'm using java again so it's kind of like if you're doing a computer science degree you will have to use java a lot a lot a lot um i know it was a joke <laughs> don't worry the 100 days of issue yes that's a joke so i'm still working on completing the 100 days of kubernetes and i want to kind of relaunch i guess the documentation for kubecon for around kubecon that's the plan and then afterwards i'm maybe gonna do 100 days of go that i planned since a long time now so that's next for me but um the thing is with Kubernetes, there are always new things coming out and always new things changing. So I will probably keep doing a lot of Kubernetes videos. Yeah. And maybe also more comprehensive courses because right now it's like all of my videos are focused on specific tools or specific problems. And if you do like one hour courses, hands on courses, then people can get a lot more out of them in terms of skill development. Um, so that would be really nice for me to focus on. Obviously, they take more time and then they take more time away from other things. Um, awesome. Are there any other questions? I have five minutes left. <laughs> Countdown. Would you like to see these kind of videos on a well, live streams on a weekly basis? I'm thinking of doing them maybe on a weekly basis, maybe inviting other people to speak because I'm getting quite exhausted <laughs> um, speaking so much. Also, maybe I should look into ways of making these live streams more fun. And it would be fun maybe to have other people or to make them in a Twitter space instead. Um, it would literally me getting up, <laughs> putting like putting makeup on and making food, sitting down on my desk and just getting up to get food and sitting down in between. That's the day of <laughs> in my life. It's just I mainly get up to get food. Um, funny. Maybe I can do like there's a nice one that somebody in the community chat on Discord actually did. Um, Rishabh, he did a two minute video of his day, uh, the life of a DevOps engineer, and that was really nice. Um, yeah, that's the life, getting up and <laughs> just for food. Um, sometimes it's really depressing because if it's nice outside, right, I obviously want to go outside, but then at the same time, I have lots of stuff to do. And so it's a bit of the balance of that's why I like working remotely because you can structure your day. Like I can work at night when it's dark versus working on the, like, and then taking out an hour a day and just going for a walk of things. Um, yeah. Awesome. This was a really fun live stream. Thank you so much for joining everybody. Um, let me know if there are any other questions, if, um, yeah, related to Kubernetes, if you want to see any specific videos, I've got lots and lots of 
um, ideas from the comments, especially from the technical comments in this chat. So this was really amazing. Thank you so much for joining and contributing to the chat because this makes it so much fun to host these live streams, right? Even if like like five people or 10 people join, it's like, it's so much fun to interact with you and like to, to comment and share my thoughts. If those are useful, right? I will publish, I think more of like short thought piece videos in the next in the next weeks i have some already lined up and they are ready like to click publish on youtube but it's like a bit more self-conscious of those like lifestyle kind of or like thought videos um on like career and other things versus technical videos right um but i will publish more of those so thank you so much for joining this was really amazing let me know if you have any other questions we have another live stream scheduled uh, on the Aqua Open Source channel, where you can see how to get started with a tool called Tracy, um, which uses a technology called eBPF under the hood to um, get further observability uh, in the into the security of your of your Linux based uh, applications. Can you say that Linux based applications? Anyway, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Maybe not, but check out the other live stream on the Aqua Open Source channel. Um, and maybe we'll publish like a little video of like just, hey, join us or something. But yeah, this was great. Thank you everybody so much. I hope you have an amazing day and I hope to see you in one of my next live streams or videos. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.